remember, remember who you are. Uh, and uh, and that's kind of like you're going to get off, but you just got to keep looking for the buggy and get back in the buggy. Everybody's going to fall out of the buggy. And, and, uh, and there's somebody, the thing is I don't want to scare you or anything, but there's somebody trying to push you out of the buggy every day. And uh, that's what this song is about. And I wish, there's so many songs I wish I'd have written. And this is another one. Because it's just such a good song. And what's really neat, hey, there's some sorry country music out there, let me tell you. I mean, sorry. Almost, you know, we, we look at some of the artists in the other genres, and I'm not real big on some of those genres. Uh, but sometimes country, we mean to look in the face. I mean, it, it's not all good. Some of those themes are not so good. And uh, But this one hit number one on the charts. And, and the main chorus says, Victory in Jesus. So that's kind of where I still kind of like country. It's accepted to sit there on the radio and be driving down the road and Victory in Jesus. I don't necessarily hear that on the rock radio. But there's a, you know, put... Be careful what you put in you because there's somebody trying to put you out of the buggy. Again, I need Keith up here. Keith, right? But I'm going to do the best I can with, with what I got. Because this first note or two. There's a long black train. And if you're all real smart because you're SAT, you'll figure out who the long black train is. There's a long black train. Coming down the line Feeding off the soul That are lost and prime Rails of sin Only evil remains Watch out brother For that long black train Look to the heavens You can look to the skies you can find redemption there and back into your eyes. There is protection and there's peace the same. Burn in your ticket for that long black train. Don't you know there's victory in the Lord, I say. Victory in the Lord. It just Cling to the Father and His holy name and don't go riding on those long black trains. There's an engineer on that long black train. He's making you wonder if the ride is worth the pain. He's just waiting on your heart to say let me ride on that long black train but don't you know there's victory in the lord i say victory in the lord i just cling to the father and his holy name and don't go riding on no long black train I can hear him whistle from a mile away. It sounds so good, but I must stay away. That train is a beauty making everybody stare. But its only destination is the middle of nowhere. Don't you know there's victory? Hey, that's a good thing. Y'all should be looking a little more peppy. Don't you know there's victory in the Lord, I say. Clap, victory in the Lord. I just cling to the Father and His holy name. And don't go riding on those long black trains. Don't you know there's victory in the Lord, I say. Victory in the Lord. I just cling to the Father and His holy name and don't go riding on no long black train. The devil's driving that long 
Y'all stay in the buggy and stay off those long black trains. That's what I get. <laughs> Thank you, Hudson. We're going to play a little recording real quick. Wanted to uh, just bring you to someone that, and there's many out there, many broken people. But <laughs> just listen to this, and then I'll fill you in on the story. Hey, Daryl, it's Tommy Ford. I just wanted to call you and tell you I'm doing good spiritually. Got healed, went to a healing, and got healed, got healed from stomach cancer. And we're going to a revival right now, or a four-day revival. So, uh, hey, I'm sorry about the way things were, but I'm doing good now, Daryl. I'm going to try to stay in here about a year now, so seek the Lord when I can. And, you know, try to change my life around a little bit. God bless you, Daryl. If any of you were here over the last few weeks, this Tommy Ford's one of our exercise riders. He was sitting right up here. He had been on about a 10-day 10, 10 drinking binge. Uh, wouldn't have made it much longer. And we, uh, we carried him out of the trees up here and brought him to church and sent him on to rehab in Galveston. And as, uh, as I was telling the jockeys in the jocks room, he used to ride, so... They were, oh, we know Tommy. He's gone through this before. You'll never change Tommy. You know, Tommy's, that's the way Tommy is. And, it was, and as we went through that, I said, yeah, but we can, we can believe for something. We can believe that God can change a man. And so as, as we, I would bring them reports as we were trying to get Johnny into this rehab center in Galveston. And I told them, hey, the guys at that rehab center are right here. They're right here in Rio Doso, and they're going to give him a ride Sunday. So Sunday is the day. We've got, to, we've got to keep Tommy. So I'm going to bring him here to church. Then we're going to have a guy stay with him at the races. And Tommy kept trying to get away. He kept trying to walk away. And I'd say, keep your eye on Tommy. And I'd have jockeys come up to me. After I rode, I was watching. Tommy's over there. And that we were all, it was, a, it was the whole family. We were working together. We were working together. To make sure Tommy got to a place where he could get off of that long black train. Where he could find the hope and the freedom and the victory that's been talked about and sung about today. And that's what this is about. When I talk about unity, when we find that unity, it's working together. Just like in this industry, there may be, and there is, great competition here. But when one is down, when a rider is down, when anything happens at this track... We pull together, and we'll pick up that one that's fallen. That's what I'm here to tell you today. As I, as I want to put something up here on the overhead that was sent to me, and it says, uh, it talks about the test of a preacher. It says, the test of a preacher is that his congregation goes away saying, not what a lovely sermon, but I will do something. I will do something. Become a part. Become a the part of that process. It's becoming a part in your own life first. It's realizing that we can't become stagnant. We can't just stay where we are. We need to keep moving forward. We need to keep having that in front of us. It's like a remodel. When I think of the vision of the chapel, and I usually do that right now, that I talk about where we're headed. Because in ministry or in a person's life, there is no point to stay still. We all need a vision. We need to look forward and say, where are we going? In life, we can get to that point where we think, I'm just not getting anywhere. I was in a counseling session. I brought a counselor in to talk to a little group I had last year. And I was telling him the situation with many of these guys that we were dealing with. And he started out, he told him, he said, you're either spiraling down or spiraling up. There's no in-between. Many of us, we get in that to where we think, oh, you know, I'm a believer. I'm going to move forward with this. And we find ourselves stagnant. Then we find ourselves maybe not reading the Word. Maybe we find ourselves not trusting God as we, we should. 
pretty soon we find ourselves, well, it's Sunday and the game starts at 11 and church isn't out until 11.10. Maybe I'll just stay home. Folks, God's put in his word that he has a remodel for us. He wants to bring us to a point where we can be useful for his kingdom, united in purpose. And it begins in Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love that word, workmanship. Because God is working in your life, and he's working in mine, and he's producing in us the craftsmanship of God himself bringing us to a point of being able to love Him, serve Him, find the compassion for others that's only going to be found as He works that into us so that we can do the things that He's prepared for us and not miss the opportunities that He's given us through our abilities and our talents to be able to do. And on in Philippians 1.6 it says, I am confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Being confident of that thing. Tommy, as I spoke with Tommy over the days that we were working with him, and I spoke to him about his walk with Christ, and even in that stupor that he was in, he said, Daryl, he had showed up to church at the beginning of the meet, and I knew that things were going on in his life, and it just kept spiraling down. But he said, I know the Lord, Daryl. I just can't get out of this can't get out. Well, I am confident. I'm confident in the foundation of my faith and I want that confidence to be such in you that when you're confronted with a situation that looks hopeless, you're not on the side, there's no hope for this person. But you're on the side that says in Christ we can find that victory. We can know that He will bring about circumstances and people into situations that will work out for His glory. And as the staff of this chapel worked in Tommy's life, it's what we do. It's what we do. The broken, the broken hearted, broken lives. It's not that this community is any different than up in town. It just works together a little closer here at a racetrack. We know each other. We know what's going on in others' lives. Sometimes that's bad. But if you're there with the right reasons and the right heart, you can be a part of a process that will turn a life around. That Christ will come in and make that difference. That you'll be part of the bridge that, that bridges that gap. That getting from point A to point B with someone, becoming new, is a process that we are part of and we should be longing for. And so it is today, as I go into this, I want to talk about two types of people. One is that one that's stagnant. They're finding a discontentment in life and they're uneasy about situations. And then there's that other person that's making that progress, that's moving forward and becoming. They're experiencing joy and peace, fulfilling and meaningful. John Ortberg says, and this is the book that I was reading. It's called The Me I Want to Be. And he says, you have confidence that whatever life throws at you will not overthrow you. When the day dawns, you awake with a sense of expectancy. You begin to receive each moment as a God-filled gift. When I read that statement, I wanted to write it down because that is where I want to be. I don't want situations to overthrow me or overtake me. I want to be, have the confidence that I'm talking about right here. And how do you get to that point? How do you get to that point for a longing for that, for the experience of that abundant life? And the very first thing is that this becoming the person God wants you to be isn't optional. Boy, he makes you miserable when you turn the other way. Just ask Jonah. Whale story. <laughs> we tend to believe that this transformation is something that happens one time. You'll hear a testimony or I'll talk to someone, do you know the Lord? And, oh yeah, when I was 12. What's he done since then? Becoming. Being transformed, becoming like him. In Romans 12, too, it says, Don't be conformed to the world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're either being transformed for the kingdom of God or you're being conformed to this world around us. There's no other option. When you stay still with God, when you refuse to listen to what He has to say to you and and you push away those contacts that He brings into your life, you're going to be conformed to this world. Influenced. In a, in a movie, you might remember The Flight of the Phoenix with Jimmy Stewart. And he was talking to one of the other characters as they were looking. The man was going to walk to, a, to what they thought would be a town nearby. And Stewart says, are you right-handed or left? And the man says he's right-handed. And Stewart said, that means your right leg is stronger than your left. Your natural gait will pull you to the left. And you'll miss that town by many miles. In our lives, we have natural tendencies. We have things in our lives that need to be transformed by God's power. We have a a, a way of thinking that's flawed. There's not one of us that shouldn't be nodding our head. Just ask the wife. Ask the person next to you. Ask the husband. (laughs) I won't go there. But these counterfeits, they try to elbow their way in. And there's that me that I want to pretend to be because in this process, we may come to that stage. We might come to a point where we just want to look like the good Christian. We might want to look like we have it all together. And so we put on that facade. We might show up to church, but we're really not paying attention. We may, we may uh, talk the talk, but we're not walking the walk. There was a lieutenant that would just taken over this assignment, and he was just fresh into his office. And as he's sitting there, he says, I'm going to impress the first private that comes my way. And he sees this private coming towards him, so he picks up the phone, and he says, Yes, General, I'll take care of it right away. I'm your man. Slams the phone down. The private heard the conversation, walks in. Lieutenant says, What can I do for you, private? He says, I'm here to hook up your phone. You ever been pretending? You're going to get caught. Because it'll be just that, it'll be that person in front of you in Walmart that has 30 items in the 15. You're going to get caught pretending. There's just so many times that we just want to, we want to put on the act. God doesn't want that. He wants us to be living real right from the heart. He wants us to be living real right in Him. He doesn't want us to be living the way we think we should be. That comes when we start comparing ourselves to someone else. And I want to be like him. I want to have that. But it's a comparison not to him. It's to someone else. Henry Nouwen says, Spiritual greatness has nothing to do with being greater than others. It has everything to do with being as great as each of us can be. God has that greatness awaiting for each of us when we don't compare ourselves to others, but let him work inside of us to be that person he wants us to be. He's in the remodel business. He's in the transformation business. And he wants to transform and change each one of us to be that person in unity of ministry with each other and with him, God's creation. He's created each one of us so unique. And then there's that thing where people, we want other people. We have so many other people that want us to be something. I joined a health club, and you know what he's after. I have a personal trainer, and uh, I started going to him. I was just feeling I, up my breath. I'd walk up this hill to get on my motorcycle, and I'd be out of breath, and I was just kind of getting a little worried at 60 years old. So I thought I better start doing something. And he always says, do a little more of this. Do more of this. And he's pushing me all the time. So he's trying to change me. He wants me to be more fit. And you might have a boss that wants you to be more productive. You have network TV that wants you to watch more TV. And restaurants, they want you to come and eat more. Or a dentist wants you to visit more. Everybody wants something. But you cannot flourish if that's where your mind is always being manipulated by others needs to be focused on the Word of God, 
needs to be having quiet time where you can listen to Him. It needs to have a time where you can say, Lord, my patience is not there. My anger level is up. I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing. Whatever it is in your life, find that place to go to Him. Be in this process. And that's number two. Becoming more like Jesus is a process. It's not an event. In Philippians 3.12 it says, I have not already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on and take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Has He taken hold of you? And if He has, press on. I haven't arrived yet. No one has, but on this road as we're moving forward, we're seeing the gratification of serving Him. We're seeing those things that hurt at times when He tweaks on us. But to know that that discipline will lead to a life, that abundant life that we find in Him. Oswald Chambers says, Discipline is long obedience in the same direction. God's not about speed. He's about distance. And He wants us to go that distance. He wants us to be made perfect in Him. He wants us to get to the other side and say, well done, good and faithful servant. He wants us to be strong in that area and know what direction we're going. To be on this pilgrimage together, to be on this journey with Him, and to know that as we receive Christ, so walk in Him. Be rooted in Him. Don't be shackled to the past. And the last thing, the last two things on here is one, becoming like Jesus is not looking out for number one. We begin to see that those who flourish, those who really are walking in Christ, become to be such a blessing to others. They bless others. And it's in unexpected ways and in humble circumstances. We've just had so many things take place this, this last couple days. Humble circumstances that people find themselves in. It's one thing about this business that breaks my heart is when I see the, uh, the brokenness in people. And it just it, it makes my heart cry out. And there's just unspecified prayers that are deep on my heart. But you can't minister and you can't be in ministry and you can't be part of a congregation that ministers to others if you're always looking out for number one. You have to have that in you that says, what can I do? How can I help? How can I be a part? How can I use the talents and gifts that God has given me to move this forward? And when I think of the vision for this chapel, there's, there's things that take place all the time. The kids club, the meals, the things that we do with counseling. All those things are things we do. God's not so much interested in what we do, but what we become. And as we have those visions for the things we do, they're important. But the most important thing is that each of us grow to what God wants us to become. And we're to minister to one another. We're to become like Him. And we can't become like Him on our own. He works in us. And He brings us to that point. He brings us to a place where it's like a farmer. You know, on a farm, that division of labor is a little different than it is in the city. On a farm, the man goes out and he takes care of the fields and the woman cooks the meals and cleans the house. Melanie already left. Okay. <laughs> Does 10 acres count for that? <laughs> that division of labor is completely different in a city or on a small piece of property. We work together. And so as I've talked to people, they say, well, whose job is this for me to become different? Is it God's job or is it mine? And in this effort, we need to know that God is at work in us and I wanted to read this, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. It says, work out your own salvation. Well, that gets that works in us up with fear and trembling. But then read the second part. It says, for it is God who is at work in you, 
enabling you to both will and to work for his good pleasure together. It's a small house. He's working right in a small place, right in our hearts. And he's bringing us to a place where he's in complete control and he's getting all the glory for what we do. As we close this service, I just wanted to tell you that the things that happen around here, they're deep on my heart. And I've, I've told people before, this is a family. I didn't have much of a family, and so you're my family. This backside is my family. When I take care of the kids or see one of the children here, uh, I watch them grow up. They're like my grandkids. Gib told me something about his grandkid. He said, Daryl, Jack was attending the, your kids club, and we were driving down to Alamogordo, and we saw that hill with a cross outside of Mescalero. And he said, is that where Jesus died? How old's Jack? Eight. eight. Jack's eight. And uh, Gibbs said no. And Jack said, well, they told me. They told me at Kids Club that he died on a hill outside of town. <laughs> he learned something. You know, and as, as you think about that, remember that first thing I put up? It's not the lovely sermon we're here for. It's that God is looking for you to do something about what you hear. He's looking for you to move forward, to not be stagnant. That, that to me is what we're here for. We're here to honor and praise God and to do things for the kingdom of God. In whatever capacity God puts that on your heart, be obedient. It's long distance. Let's pray. Father, as we leave this place, the things that that have taken place this summer and we look forward to just things going on next year that will be just just even, even greater. You do such wonderful things, magnificent things. When we get on board your train, going in that right direction, we never know what surprises you have for us and it, 